Um, hello everyone, I'm talking to you today from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in Sydney's inner west. I'm very pleased to be with you here today and to be able to beam in from a different place. Um, so I'd like to first just begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land I'm currently living and working on here in Sydney. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is not so much a paper as a series of thoughts I've been having about critiquing my own research practices in particular ways and looking at particular ways that it might inadvertently propagate structures of colonialism or exclusion and bias, um, unconscious or otherwise. Um, so I'm hoping to provoke discussion. It's going to be a fairly personal journey and I was really thrilled to hear all of um, Nina's expertise just now. Um, I'm a humble historian, not a trained librarian, and I'm just sort of thinking about how I can reach back into the past and find a bigger range of voices to represent what I want to talk about. So I started by thinking about why we or I, I guess specifically, um, make bibliographies and study book history. And I think that the reason a lot of people do it and why I do it certainly is because I think that literature, creative writing and so on can tell us something about human society, about the time that it was written and that it's important in some way. And even the most strident formalist um, looking at texts, you know, without referring to any external influences must be trying to answer some kind of bigger picture and extrapolating from what they're studying. But as book historians, we're also interested in the wider context. What conditions enabled the production of that particular text and what does that say about history and society and so on? And for me, bibliography was about looking at all that was on offer rather than what I'd been told was worthy of attention and trying to circumvent ingrained assumptions built up around the literary canon. So for my um, PhD project, I used a list of books published by New Zealand writers to look into ideas about expatriatism and writers, and I don't have time to explain the arguments behind that, but I have put a little plug down the bottom of the resultant book in case you want to go and read about that. But I also encountered a problem that in trying to deconstruct these narrow ideas about the New Zealand psyche represented in writing, there's a risk of simply replacing the narrow ideas that you're trying to deconstruct with a slightly broader version. And for reasons of scope within my PhD project, I just looked at published books and specifically fiction, novels, poetry and short stories. And so as a result, the viewpoint I was representing was limited to a fairly narrow section of society. And it was people who were in the right position to be able to write the right sort of creative fiction and have managed to get it published. And as you can imagine, there was a, a big overrepresentation of white middle class people from the time period I was looking at, which was um, the early 20th century. So I tried to make this clear um, when I was writing my thesis and book that I was representing this particular viewpoint. But now that I'm thinking about my next project, I think it's important to start asking quite difficult questions, um, such as the ones that I've got on the slide just here. What, what range of perspectives does a bibliographic approach represent? And if the answer to any of the first three questions are yes, so is it representing a narrow set of literary formats within a Western tradition and work de deemed worthy of publication by a fairly narrow set of people, if any of those questions are yes, I also want to ask, what is then the value of representing these already well represented perspectives? And what can I do to broaden the range of perspectives I'm looking at, away from just the kind of kinds of people who had books published and whose literary papers have been kept in archives? It's very difficult to begin on this kind of journey because the whole system is set up to propagate the point of view of the set of people I was just talking about. And I have to admit at this time, as a white middle-class person myself, I'm in, ingrained in all of this as well. Um, and the whole system is set up to propagate the logics of capitalism, colonialism, and these are very difficult structures to try and come up against. But just because it's difficult, I don't think does, um, means, doesn't mean that one shouldn't try. 
And so at this point, I started to wonder whether book history and bibliography was just the wrong thing to be doing to be studying these things. So I looked around for some um, inspiration and some help, basically, from other scholars. And I found a few things. Um, one particularly interesting thing I found was a session from this year's SHARP conference, um, which was online, obviously. And they had a roundtable called Decolonizing Book History. And in the early stages of this roundtable, um, Professor Priya Joshi was talking about what people needed to do to undo these structures and interrogate the archive and so on. And she said, um, what I've paraphrased there, that we need to think about reading the same things in different ways or reading different things. And so for the first point, reading the same things in different ways, I think my new project is, in a sense, an attempt to do that, to broaden perspectives by looking at texts in different ways. Um, I've been looking at trans-Tasman perspectives, which is an area that's been largely overlooked in favour of establishing separate New Zealand and Australian literary traditions. But the two countries and literary communities have been interlinked since the first colonial incursions into the area, and many works of literature depict trans-Tasman stories, journeys, and perspectives. So I, haven't, I have examples here from um, each of the points I'm going to make, but I won't have time to go into them very much. So if anyone sees anything that they're interested in, you might need to ask a question about it. Um, one thing I found is there's a lot of writing in New Zealand books, especially about the symbolic role of Sydney and journeys to Sydney in the minds of early 20th century New Zealanders. And this is just an example from Edith Sill Grossman's novel, Angela and Messenger, um, with one of the protagonists' opinions of Sydney, which I find amusing. So centering these aspects of well-known or lesser known creative fiction can amount to reading the same things in different ways and hopefully uncovering at least a slightly broader range of insights and new takes on um, aspects of Australian and New Zealand history. But I'm still looking at novels, poetry and creative fiction. And however obscure and understudied, this is still a pretty narrow approach. So moving on to the second point Priya Joshi made, which was reading different things. I've got a few ideas for hopefully broadening the scope of my research in this way. So the first thing I was interested in was looking at who is missing from the stories of um, published work. And one possible avenue for looking at this is trying to find people who were trying to get published and failed, which is of course a difficult task to begin with because there's no book to find, no record. Um, but one place that I've found a few leads in this area is um, the archives of publishing companies, so things like rejection letters. And here computational techniques can help. Um, I've got a link there, which is a project that I was working on over the past few years, which is a digital tool for looking at large publishing collections. We talked about it last year at the conference. And this tool uses optical character recognition and keyword tagging to find um, things that you wouldn't be able to find just by looking or you might find, but you'd be incredibly lucky. So in this case, I have an example, I think, yes, um, of a rejection letter or a review of a Miles Franklin novel where the book was ultimately not recommended. So Angus and Robertson didn't end up publishing this book. So you would never look in this particular collection, which is around upwards possibly of a million documents in the State Library of New South Wales. You wouldn't look there if you were looking for Miles Franklin material, but the digital um, tool can help you locate more things. Um, and of course, I'm not trying to say that Miles Franklin is an underrepresented perspective, but it's just an example. So the next idea I had was looking at not just books, which is a pretty obvious one. Um, newspapers are a huge source of published material and there's a sort of lower bar for inclusion, a broader range of contributors. So I've got a shout out there to Kath Bode and her work on understudied serialized fiction in newspapers. And so again, computational methods can help find more stuff in this sense. And the problem with looking at newspapers is there's such a huge scope, which was why I didn't include them in my PhD work. 
Um, the next idea I had was not being limited to English, which is again, usually a problem of scope, but really um, limiting the books or texts on your list to just English can severely limit the range of perspectives on offer. Um, and it's tricky. I found that um, for the past six months, for example, I've been doing a um, distance Toreo course and just the extra confidence that that's given me when confronted with a, more, a wall of text in Māori has, I think, really opened me up to more possibilities. And I've got a shout out there to Auslit because they have a database, they have things in other languages and quite a broad range of items. So I think I've been arguing for a while that New Zealand needs um, a version of Auslit, um, whether or not that's ever going to happen is another story. So my next point is just look. Um, you can sort of fall into this trap of thinking there's not a lot out there apart from what you've been told is out there. But um, there's a wonderful resource that is digitized from um, by the UC Digital Arts Lab. It's called Comography of Maori Writing in English. Um, put together by Bridget Underhill as part of her PhD project, I think. And just having a browse in there uncovered so much more stuff um, written by Māori and some from the time period I was interested in. And I have an example here from a, um, it's actually from a Māori newspaper, so relevant to the um, talk we heard on Monday. And this man, Oropata Wahawaha, went on a trip to Australia in 1874, and um, I think he was a chief from Ngāti Poro, and he wrote about it, and then it was later translated. And so there's some really interesting observations about Pākehā, and in this case, he's talking about Australian, white Australians as Pākehās, which is also interesting. Um, and this made me realise that I needed to open up to travel accounts and memoirs and things like that if I wanted to broaden the perspectives of um, these journeys to Australia from New Zealand. And so the next point is looking at different objects or reading different objects. And this isn't a new idea for bibliography and book history in terms of broadening from textual objects or the idea of viewing, broadening the idea of what a text is um, to encompass different types of cultural expressions. And of course, thinking of um, D.F. McKenzie's work and bibliography and the sociology of texts is one of the sort of pioneers of these ideas. I've also come across a few criticisms of McKenzie's approach, more recent criticisms, um, asking whether this is still trying to shoehorn these ideas into a Western framework. So saying something is like a text, um, do we really need to do that? And that's why I've got that reference there to Matt Cohen, which is an interesting article on in the subject that I found. Um, so I've, I was just thinking around the subject and wondering if maybe creativity could be the organizing principle rather than um, text. And so then it doesn't need to be like a text, but it could be a creative representation of a topic, event, or a point in time and so on. And this is just an idea, but the broader point is that I think it's important to think about the organizing principles that I'm using and whether or not this is reinforcing a certain epistemological framework, very much echoing what Nina was saying in a much more expert way about cataloging. Um, so bibliography could potentially be representative rather than comprehensive. I think as scholars and certainly as a historian, there's an idea that you have to capture everything, be really comprehensive, but perhaps being representative could be the aim as in trying to find as many different kinds of um, perspectives and types of text and so on. And this could also allow a person collecting evidence about a particular topic to resist period periodization and Western notions of linear time, which are also quite constraining in terms of opening up um, ideas and other worldviews. So this might allow um, someone making a 
bibliography or type of bibliography to incorporate other worldviews that originate from oral cultures. And these oral cultures are not relegated to the distant past, but they live on in the present day writings and teachings of Indigenous writers and scholars, for example. So this is just my, my thinking through of these ideas. I think it's important to examine these things and doing so has led me to find a much more interesting variety of creative expressions and stories about journeys to Australia. So I'm quite pleased with how it's going. I don't think I'm anywhere near the end of this journey, but I'm just gonna leave you with this example from Callan Park in Sydney, which according to a rather dubious website that I found, these um, rock carvings were carved by two Māori twins who were incarcerated in the mental hospital there in Callan Park in 1879. And supposedly they predicted the visit of the prophet Ratana in 1924, which um, it's not something I verified, but, and I, I need to look into this more, but I'm pretty sure there's an interesting trans-Tasman story to be found here regardless. Uh, so thank you.